As of when I'm recording this, I have no idea who's going to be sitting in this chair for the next term, but I do know they're going to hit the age of the oldest acting president in this next term, regardless of who wins. So I started looking into that topic a little bit, and I found a very interesting mystery about a president that passed away while he was serving in office and why there's a lot of people that think it's actually an unsolved murder. We're going to check that out on today's Brain Scratch. Happy Friday and welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. You know, we sometimes look into cold cases on this channel, uh, sometimes cases 30, 40, occasionally even 50 years old. This might be one of the oldest cases that we've ever reviewed on Brain Scratch. We are going back nearly 100 years to look into a little bit of mystery around a president's death and try to determine, is there something else at play that was going on there? And you know, a lot of people say history tends to repeat itself. Sick president, global pandemic, racial injustice. Welcome to the U.S. election of 1920. Quote, America's present need is not heroics, but healing, not revolution, but restoration said Warren Harding. The parallels to today's campaign are remarkable. Of course, he would become president, and just after a few years of service, unfortunately, would pass away. Here is a shot from the front page of the New York Times, looking back at August 1923. President Harding dies suddenly. Now, there's an official version of his story, of course, hosted at whitehouse.gov. Uh, so let's take a look at that together. Warren G. Harding was the 29th president of the United States. He served from 1921 to 1923. Harding, born near Marion, Ohio in 1865, became the publisher of a newspaper. He married a divorcee, Mrs. Florence Kling DeWolf. He was a trustee of the Trinity Baptist Church, a director of almost every important business, and a leader in fraternal organizations and charitable enterprises. Harding's undeviating republicanism and vibrant speaking voice, plus his willingness to let the machine bosses set policies, led him far in Ohio politics. He served in the state Senate and as lieutenant governor. He won the presidential election by an unprecedented landslide of 60% of the popular vote. In August of 1923, he died in San Francisco. Now remember, this is the whitehouse.gov version of this story. They're saying he died of a heart attack. And that's where we start seeing deviations right off the bat. Let's now jump over and look at history.com's version. In a hotel in San Francisco, President Warren G. Harding dies of a stroke at the age of 58. Harding was returning from a presidential tour of Alaska and the West Coast, a journey some believed he had embarked on to escape the rumors circulating in Washington of corruption in his administration. Conscious of his own limitations, Harding promised to appoint a cabinet representing the best minds in America, but unfortunately, he chose several intelligent men who possessed little sense of public responsibility. On August 2nd, he died of an embolism, perhaps brought on by worry over the political scandals about to explode on the national stage. Early the next morning, Vice President Calvin Coolidge was sworn in as president. For the rest of his first term, one of President Coolidge's principal duties was responding to public outrage over the scandals and the reports of his predecessor's multiple extramarital affairs. Uh, this story has everything in it. We're, we're even going to get information from a psychic in this story. Just, just buckle up. They give us a little more detail in another article called The Unexpected Death of President Harding. Harding abruptly died in bed, supposedly as his wife read to him a flattering article about himself. Accounts differ as to who was in the room at the time and the exact sequence of events. Um, but this is kind of what I'm hearing for the popular version of this story. Essentially, he goes on this tour and 
people are starting to notice he might not be doing well. But, you know, when a president goes on a tour like that, they take staff, doctors come along with them. The doctors keep kind of saying, no, 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 it's OK. He's he's doing he's doing fine. Um, but he seems to be struggling at one of his stops. He has to kind of hold on to the podium. He's in Alaska and he calls it Nebraska. It, it, it definitely seems like something is going on with him as he's going out on this tour. As a matter of fact, some of the information I'm seeing says that San Francisco actually wasn't exactly a planned stop. He did have some stuff to do in California, but they canceled his slate and then kind of stopped in San Francisco, uh, where he unfortunately passed away. But extramarital affairs, political scandal coming up on his back. I mean, could that induce a heart attack? I would certainly think so. The main problem is we've got information uh, from the people that were actually there. So let's start looking at some information from constitutioncenter.org. The details of the president's death remained murky for decades amidst rumors of scandal or even worse. Today, most historians accept that Harding, 57, died from a heart attack brought on by ample evidence of cardiac problems. But that wasn't the original cause of death issued in 1923, as rumors soon started flying after the president's passing. Doctors said in published accounts that Harding died from the effects of a stroke. Very, very different. Uh, and there was no autopsy done on the body of the president at his wife's request. And that's not even the strangest of it. Uh, no autopsy. Um, I believe she wanted him uh, prepared for burial very quickly, wouldn't allow uh, even a face mask, which is kind of standard for, for a president to be taken. Uh, Dr. Ray Lyman Wilbur was at the hotel when Harding arrived for the treatment, and he recalled the evidence that followed in his memoirs. We shall never know exactly the immediate cause of President Harding's death since every effort that was made to secure an autopsy met with complete and final refusal, he wrote. We are belabored and attacked by newspapers antagonistic to Harding and by cranks and quacks. We were accused of starving the president to death, of feeding him to death, of assisting in slowly poisoning him. We were accused of being a, as abysmally ignorant, stupid, and incompetent, and even of malpractice, he recalled. In recent years, historians have been able to read personal papers from the era that shed more light on Harding's death. The decision by Harding's wife, Florence, to skip an autopsy for her husband and have his body embalmed one hour after his death fed the rumor mill in 1923. Later, in 1930, a former Harding administration member published a book claiming that Florence Harding poisoned her husband, a rumor that was soon debunked. Um, that's an interesting statement, and I wanted to include it, even though I can't tell you guys how that rumor was debunked. I could tell you information that came out about the book is uh, I'm seeing different things. I'm seeing that this was a private investigator. I'm seeing, no, this was actually a federal agent. Um, but I'm seeing that he reached out to a ghostwriter and the ghostwriter pretty much wrote the book. So it's highly fictionalized. Does that mean that there's no elements of truth to any of that book? I don't know. I would think that even if he's working with a ghostwriter, he's probably going to pass along some form of information. Um, but I, I don't know. The scandals involving Harding kept coming after his death, including claims he had fathered an illegitimate daughter in the White House with his alleged mistress, Nan Britton. Witnesses said Harding didn't look well during the trip and that he may have suffered a bout with food poisoning after eating seafood. Harding's doctors were concerned enough about his health to, to divert his train to San Francisco. Harding was able to walk off the train into a limousine, which took him to the Palace Hotel. Doctors huddled over the president for several days. Harding appeared to rally on August 2nd, but he slumped over in his bed sometime after 7 p.m. and died almost instantly. The initial official cause of death was a stroke, but that has been discounted in recent years. It was a heart attack, said historian Robert Farrell in a 1996 interview with C-SPAN. The suddenness of his passing ruled out a stroke, he said. Um just want to point out, and I don't know, but I'm not seeing in this article, they're not calling him Dr. Robert Farrell. They're saying he's a historian. 
Uh, it seems, I don't know, we'll, we'll review some more information about that assumption. One reason the doctors listed a stroke as cause of death, he said, is that physicians didn't fully understand heart attack symptoms in the 1920s. Uh, so yeah, I was kind of curious about that because first of all, we have a historian that's kind of making this call. This article is leaning on that. And this article is even going to say that, you know, this other stuff is debunked, but of course they're not pointing that out. Um, so I was curious, could you die instantly from a stroke? Because that seems to be this person's point. The suddenness of his passing ruled out a stroke over at webmd.com. Strokes are the fifth most common cause of death in men. Uh, in men behind heart disease. So the, the numbers certainly support that the likelihood is, uh, is heart disease, uh, cancer and accidents. Strokes are also more likely to be fatal and strike earlier in men than in women. The consequences of a stroke can be devastating. Not only can a stroke kill you, but non-fatal strokes can leave you severely debilitated, paralyzed, or unable to communicate. Um, so that's still not quite strong enough for me. It's not saying immediately or instantly. So I dug a little bit more. I found this website, stroke.org.uk. And here they have a specific section, sudden death due to a stroke. Like a heart attack, a stroke can sometimes be devastating enough to take a life in an instant. That seems very clear to me. So basing it on an assumption that a stroke doesn't kill you instantly um, here we're, we're at least getting, there is a number of strokes that happen that can actually kill you instantly. If a large stroke happens in a part of the brain vital to breathing or the heart, it can lead to death in a short time. If the stroke is very large, it can cause widespread damage that the brain can't survive, even if the cause of a clot or a bleed is treated. So pretty compelling information to me that we cannot rule out stroke just because uh, the president died so immediately. Word quickly spread that Mrs. Harding had poisoned him to prevent him from being brought up on charges of corruption. Harding left the bulk of his estate valued at $850,000 to his wife. So, and, and this is where it's hard because we're, we're looking at this thing through a really long lens, very narrowed information. Uh, I can tell you there's even just reading into this presidency, there's points of view that even though they're being written now are extremely different about what type of president he is, of course, because we've got two very distinct views that are happening in this country. Some people are looking back at him and saying, wow, he was a he was a terrible president top to bottom. Other people now I'm starting to see kind of a run of newer articles that are saying, hold on, hold on. History hasn't really been fair about this. And now if you actually go and look at some of the things that he did and some of the initiatives that he was pushing, he was actually a pretty good president. Um, and there's other people pointing out that he seemed to be pretty progressive in terms of racial equality and some other things like that. So it, it's very hard for me to kind of get a sense of that. I really want to try to focus in a little bit on, is it reasonable to think for some reason that his wife would have possibly poisoned him? I mean, that's kind of the core theory that comes out because of this book, um, who, once again, the book we know is highly fictionalized because it's written by someone that isn't kind of a first party participant in what's actually going on around this. Um, but knowing that there's $850,000 a hundred years ago that's being left specifically to his wife, do we have some possible motive already? Yes. And then we've kind of got this touch of, is he sleeping around behind her on top of that? We're hearing he might have an illegitimate child. Information I've looked into says everyone close to him said um, he wasn't able to have children, that he had suffered from mumps when he was very young, and essentially he wasn't able to have any children. So now you've got this kind of rumor about an Ill illegitimate child, possibly that was conceived in the White House, which we're going to look into that too, because those details kind of don't hold up to extremely easy scrutiny. But let's see if we can dig in a little more and try to understand this uh, by looking into that mistress, Nan Britton. And there is a Wikipedia article all about her. Nana Popham Britton, November 9th, 1896 to March 21st, 1991, 95 years, uh, was an American secretary who was a mistress of Warren G. Harding. 
Uh, yeah, Wikipedia seems to be calling it right out. After she graduated from high school in 1914, Britton moved to New York City to begin a career as a secretary. However, she claimed she had also begun an intimate relationship with Harding. Now, that's in 1914. That is well before he is actually president. Following Harding's death, Britton wrote what is considered to be the first kiss and tell book. In The President's Daughter, published in 1927, she claimed she had been Harding's mistress throughout his presidency and named him as the father of her daughter, Elizabeth Ann. Uh, now here, we can see Elizabeth Ann was born in 1919. That is before he took office, nearly two years before he actually took office as president. So there was kind of, in one of the previous articles, this statement that uh, the, the child was actually conceived in the White House or something like that, uh, it, that doesn't make sense because the child's conceived before he has access to the White House. One famous passage told of her having sex in a coat closet in the executive office of the White House. And I think that's what's happening is people are kind of meshing together um, parts, different parts of the book. And now we've got this new version of the story that, oh yeah, there was an illegitimate child and she was conceived in the coat closet in the executive office. According to Britain, Harding had promised to support their daughter, but after his sudden death in, two, in 1923, his wife, Florence, refused to honor the obligation. Britain insisted that she wrote her book to earn money to support her daughter and to champion the rights of illegitimate children. Britain died in 1991 in Sandy, Oregon, where she had lived during the last years of her life. She insisted until her death that Harding was her daughter's father. And if we jump over to the New York Times, this is an article actually from 2015. DNA is said to solve a mystery of Warren Harding's love life. Nan Britton with her daughter Elizabeth in a picture from 1930. And before we go on, I just want to say, uh, look at this photo. Um, you know, does, does Elizabeth look like her mother a little bit? Certainly. But I got to tell you, and I, I don't want to turn this into a, an episode of Maury here or something, but... Uh, seriously, like, I think Elizabeth has picked up some of her father's traits as well. Um, if this was an episode of Maury, let's just saying, let's, let's just say that I would be saying he is the father. Nearly a century later, according to genealogists, new genetic tests confirm for the first time that Ms. Britton's daughter, Elizabeth Ann Blasing, which might be pronounced blessing, uh, was indeed Harding's biological child. No question about it there. The tests have solved one of the enduring mysteries of presidential history and offer new insights into the secret life of America's 29th president. And just, I'm just pointing out to you guys, I'm going down this road a little bit, trying to understand this relationship, trying to understand this possible uh, illegitimate child situation, because I'm trying to understand if there are potential motives for his wife to have harmed him, ended his life, something along those lines. The revelation has also roiled two families that have circled each other warily for 90 years, struggling with issues of rumor, truth, and fidelity. Even now, members of the president's family remain divided over the matter, with some still skeptical after a lifetime of denial and unhappy about cousins who chose to pursue the question. Some descendants of Ms. Britton remain resentful that it's taken this long for evidence to come out and for her credibility to be validated. Uh, yeah, and obviously she passed away a number of years before this. Uh, I believe Elizabeth actually also passed away before any of this information came out. It's sort of Shakespearean and operatic, said Dr. Peter Harding, a grandnephew of the president and one of those who instigated the DNA testing. This story hangs over the whole presidential history because it was an unsolved mystery. Dr. Harding and his cousin, Abigail Harding, decided to pursue the matter and made contact with James Blasing, a grandson of Ms. Britton and son of the daughter she claimed to have conceived with the president. Testing by Ancestry DNA, a division of Ancestry.com, the genealogical website, found that Mr. Blazing was a second cousin to Peter and Abigail Harding, meaning that Elizabeth Ann Blazing had to be President Harding's daughter. That information, it, it just, it doesn't lie. It, it's, it's literally science. It's, 
there's there's no way to really say hey we've got a bum result here there is a a certain per margin of error or a certain percentage but it is so minuscule so interesting to me that we're able to get answers like this once again through dna and through amazing genealogists that know how to use that information to really drive out these answers i hope at some point people just get over the fact that uh, you know, hiding situations like this. It's just, it's not going to be feasible. I mean, yeah, here we're talking about a president and, you know, maybe the, the, the resources or the expenses for taking on that type of testing are a little bit higher than they will be in 10 years, than they will be in 20 years. I mean, is it literally going to be an app on our phone at some point or some little finger prick you do somewhere and all of a sudden all your information is just there? It's going to get easier. It's going to get simpler. But family dynamics, I don't know if they're ever going to get easier or simpler. I just hope that people figure out you're not going to be able to cover these types of things up anymore. I mean, talk about Maury. Look, look at what his episodes do on a daily basis. All right. So in terms of potential motives, huge amount of money, $850,000 a hundred years ago. Uh, on top of that, confirmed infidelity with a child that is part of that equation. Could his wife have found out about that in some way? Uh, I think that's certainly a possibility. But there's also a legacy. There's the presidency. She was a first lady. Um, you know, there was things that she was able to do being in that position. And did she think that that was possibly coming to an end because of all this corruption stuff that was heading their way? Uh, I think there's something to that possibly as well. But... Then we get this article at the Mercury News, and this is in 2018, and it's kind of supporting that wacky story that came out in that book that we think is somewhat fictionalized. Let's see what we can learn here. Palace Intrigue. On 95th anniversary of President Warren G. Harding's death, San Francisco man renews poison theory. Uh, and here we have a picture. Essentially, this man is a descendant of someone that was working or actually president of that hotel back at the time. There's one thing about Harding that remains as fascinating and probably unanswerable nearly a century later. Was he murdered? Conventional history says no. Richard Sharon would beg to differ. Nearly a century after Harding's death, Sharon, a descendant of the once politically prominent family that founded the Palace Hotel in 1875 and owned it into the 1950s, decided it was time to tell the public about a long-held family secret. Warren Harding, Sharon said recently, belongs on a list of assassinated presidents. Chaos gripped the palace on the evening of August 2, 1923. The story at the time goes that the First Lady had been reading to the president from a Saturday Evening Post profile of him as he laid in bed. Oh, that's good, he said about a passage. Go on. Then suddenly... He shuddered and was gone. Vice President Calvin Coolidge was awakened while on vacation in Vermont and quickly sworn in. Americans awoke to stunning headlines. But the president's exact cause of death has remained mysterious. Harding's favorite doctor was a homeopath described as a quack. He'd been urging the president to drink concoctions he called purgatives to purgatives, I believe, to regain his health. It's unknown what they actually were. Florence Harding insisted that no autopsy be performed. She ordered that the president be embalmed immediately. The poisoning theory exploded across the country in a 1930 book, The Strange Death of President Harding, written by Gaston Means. He was a private detective once hired by Florence Harding to do surveillance of her husband and his mistress. So honestly, I don't know which story to believe about Gaston means. I've heard about four different things. This is the one that actually has him kind of furthest removed from actually being an employee that would be around the situation closely. Um, and I don't know if this is just kind of more romantic to write it this way, that he was a private investigator. And I don't know if it actually helps kind of the backing of the story by saying that he was doing surveillance on the president and his mistress, because now, all of a sudden, we're also highlighting, you know, a, a potential motive for this as well. But Florence Harding, the president's wife, died in 1924, and Means theories quickly faded into history's dustbin. Um, 
That statement also doesn't make a lot of sense to me because the book supposedly came out in 1930. So um, I don't know why her dying in 1924 actually affected his theory at all or his his book. Um, I think that's just a badly constructed sentence. But it is kind of interesting to me that, um, yeah, she survives, I think, just about a year and like four months or something after the president. Um, and she she has been fighting with issues uh, with her kidney practically her whole life. Members of the Sharon family have always believed that the president's death in their hotel likely involved foul play. It all revolves around Janet Johnston, the granddaughter of the hotel's founder, U.S. Senator William Sharon. Johnston was the palace's president. Suddenly, on a summer night, she had a dead U.S. president in her hotel. Florence Harding had sent for Johnston. When she arrived at the presidential suite, the first lady flew into a rage. Food the hotel had served Harding had killed him, Florence Harding screamed. Johnston called the claim ludicrous. Florence Harding was yelling that she was going to sue, that she would own the place. Johnston wouldn't back down. She would not let her hotel be tarnished. As the woman faced off, Johnston noticed a half-filled glass near the president's bed. She picked it up and found it had a strongly noxious odor. Johnston suspected whatever was in the glass had something to do with Warren Harding's death. She told Florence Harding she intended to have the contents of the glass analyzed. The president's widow looked stricken, according to the legend, and I'm glad they're calling it legend here. But before Johnston could leave the suite, Florence Harding stepped toward her, snatched the glass away, and managed to pour whatever was in it down a drain. She turned to Johnston and said, there will be no lawsuit. Johnston kept the story in the family, Richard Sharon said, not wanting to insinuate Florence Harding was involved in a plot to kill the president without any evidence. Uh, This article also goes to say there's other family members that are saying, yeah, I've, I've heard this story as well. Doctor's notes and records of the president's vital signs point toward cardiac issues plaguing him during his travels. His complaints included indigestion, insomnia, and pain down his left arm, symptoms now commonly associated with heart disease. Um, that is, in my opinion, at least a much more educated, uh, reasoning, let's just say for assuming heart disease much rather than, well, he died quickly. So there's no way that was heart disease. So I'm glad that there's actually some better detail here. That's helping us come to that understanding that it is looking like it was heart disease, but then there's something in this article that kind of grabbed me too. Um, And that's the account about this doctor that is described as a quack. And, you know, we've got him giving the president things. We're unsure of what these drugs are. And interestingly, when I looked at the Wikipedia for the president's wife, Florence Mabel Harding, I see a lot of references to this doctor. This doctor was around a whole lot. Now, I'm not I mean, I think there's an easy and maybe overly simplistic assumption that was there some type of romance that was going on between Florence and this doctor? I haven't found anything, anything to support that. And certainly a lot of us have long term relationships with our doctors. Um, That's just something they're, you know, they're part of our inner circle. We we need them to take care of us as, as we're going through this life. Um, but let's learn just a little bit more about Florence as well. And I'm not going to go into all the details. Let me just say, I'm kind of impressed at, um, all the things that she did as first lady in that period of time. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing to me that, that they were so active. Um, but let's, let's, uh, get through this information here trying to weave in a little bit of what she was known for. In February of 1905, Florence needed emergency surgery for floating kidney and was initially treated by a homeopathic doctor, Charles E. Sawyer. His close links with the Harding family and Florence's total trust and dependence on him would later prove controversial. During her convalescence, when she's basically recovering from a surgery where uh, they wired the kidney in place, Um, but she's recovering. Uh, Warren began an affair with a close friend of hers, Carrie Phillips. So this is another woman. Florence did not find out until she intercepted a letter between the two in 1911, which led her to consider divorce, though she never pursued it. So 
She's figuring that out in 1911, obviously well before the presidency. Something else I bumped into is apparently these letters that Warren would write to Carrie Phillips in particular, we're talking like dozens and dozens of pages for one letter. Like I think one of them I read or one of the quotes I read about it is one of the letters was 40 pages long. It's one of several adulterous escapades that Warren embarked upon, of which Florence found herself increasingly resigned, though she expressed her disapproval. She tried to discourage the affairs by sticking by her husband's side at all times. Despite her feelings on the matter, Florence remained silent on women's suffrage during the 1912 election. She continued to be treated by Dr. Sawyer at his new White Oaks Sanitarium for various ailments and deepened her study of astrology. Florence suffered a serious kidney attack in the winter of 1913 and went to live at the White Oaks Sanitarium, where Dr. Sawyer is. In January of 1916, Florence suffered from heart palpitations. Who'd she call? Dr. Sawyer, and uh, also to help her with mental health issues. By 1920, Warren G. Harding was a contender for the Republican presidential nomination. Florence gave him tentative support, apparently influenced by a Washington clairvoyant, Madame Marcia Champre, who correctly forecast that Warren would become president, but added that he would die in office. So, um, interesting. We, we have a clairvoyant who's saying, yeah, he'll be president, but he's not going to survive. On election night, Warren received 404 electoral votes, defeating Democratic challenger James M. Cox, who received 127 on March 4th, 1921, Florence Harding became first lady, immediately taking an active role in national politics at times, even appearing to dominate the president. In Warren's first pronouncement as president, he ordered that the gates of the White House be open to the public, as per Florence's wishes. The move was praised by the press with an announcement that tourists could come to the property in the following week. By the time the White House opened to the public, Florence offered to act as tour guide herself. And one of the people that came through for one of those tours, Albert Einstein. Florence relished in her role as White House tour guide, learning about the history of the property. The first couple increased their popularity by attending movie screenings and meeting actors who were previously seen as vulgar by high society. Florence was an outward proponent of maintaining prohibition as respect for the law, but in private, she secretly served alcohol to guests. Florence worked to protect the image of herself and Warren, concealing his drinking, womanizing, and corruption in the cabinet. So there we at least get a very strong dose of um, protecting the image of herself and Warren. So just a little sign of how much the legacy is actually meaning to her there. Um, I don't know if that's enough to say that, you know, she wanted to end his life before that got ruined. And if that's what she wanted, seemingly it didn't work because that information still came out. It's just the next president was now dealing with it. In public, Florence always bragged about the president and his accomplishments, but in private, she let her political difference be known. She would frequently express how the executive should best perform his job. She sometimes argued with him over the content of his speeches, occasionally shaking a finger at him if she was upset. Once she became upset at a speech that proposed a single presidential term of six years and refused to leave until the clause was omitted. So you can see this is a first lady very involved in his day-to-day -day work as well. In 1922, Florence instructed her Secret Service agent, Harry Barker, to keep tabs on her husband, especially if she happened to be away from him. Her discovery of the affair with Nan Britton took its toll on her health. So... This seems to confirm she did become aware of Nan Britton, despite the fact that I think Nan's book is also published after Florence passes away. In early September, she came down with a serious kidney ailment. The eminent physician, Charles Horace Mayo, was called in to treat her, which sparked jealousy from Dr. Sawyer. By the time he arrived, the first lady was suffering from septicemia and was falling in and out of consciousness. The gates of the White House were open to accommodate the thousands of well-wishers who came to pray for the First Lady. As she fought back from what she called the Valley of Death, Florence spontaneously relieved an obstruction. I think I know what that means. Uh, and required bed care from the nurses. Her condition gradually improved to the point that Dr. Mayo did not feel his service was necessary. 
a sign of Florence's improving condition was the reopening of the White House to tourists. So one thing that did just kind of pop into my mind about this is the time frame. If we've got, you know, middle of 1922, she's got an agent that's kind of looking into this affair with Nan Britton. She might have been aware of it before, but is information that's coming in from that agent, is that adding to her pressures about or her jealousy or how she's feeling about her husband? I don't know, because we've got her kind of setting a precedent with him years before this, where she's catching him being inappropriate and she's not divorcing him. She's not leaving him. They're seemingly working forward through it. Um, so I don't know, but is there a breaking point? Is this like a, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back situation? Her illness and recovery took its toll on her husband, who did show genuine care for her, but also wanted more freedom for himself. I uh, wonder what he was going to do with his extra time. Florence declared, this illness has been a blessing since it drew the two closer together. Warren read to her in bed about Ye Yellowstone Park, a place where she longed to return. Florence also placed her complete trust in Dr. Sawyer, whom Warren believed had brought her back to life. Uh, a lot of taps on Dr. Sawyer throughout this whole story. Uh, she was the first first lady to vote, operate a movie camera, own a radio, or invite movie stars to the White House, something that certainly has happened more since. And then in widowhood, um, Florence had intended to make a new life in Washington and was planning a tour of Europe. But when her kidney ailment returned, she followed Sawyer's advice and took a cottage in the grounds of his sanitarium in Marion. So once again, back close to Dr. Sawyer. Her last public appearance was at the local Remembrance Day Parade where she stood to salute the veterans. On November 21st, 1924, she died of renal failure. So it seems like the kidney disease finally did, unfortunately, end her life. When I was reading more about Florence, I was just hoping to find some some information to really dive into what their relationship was a bit more like. I think I got a tone of it. I mean, someone that's very involved in his political career, uh, I think a quote from her was that she said that he was her only hobby. Um, it, I just, I didn't see anything that was very telling about them having, yes, they were having trouble in terms of him and infidelity, but that was like a long standing issue that was going on for a prolonged period of time. It's not like she had just found out, you know, that he had affairs with multiple women and that all happened within a few months leading up to his death that might be seen as mysterious. Um, I was, I was kind of surprised because in the overview versions of the story, they're never talking about her personality, the things that she had done politically. I mean, you could get a, a bit of a sense of what type of person she is through some of that. Um, but it's still obviously not the same as what happens, what happens in four walls between two married people. That could be a very, very different thing from the perception from the outside. Um, but Found some interesting points here at Mental Floss. If there was no foul play afoot, why deny an autopsy? It's such a good question. I, I just, I can't think of any, I mean, maybe a reasonable explanation would be she couldn't take the thought of him going, of his body being put through that process. Maybe there's something to that. Um, according to the National First Lady's Library, Florence may have been trying to protect the reputation of her husband's doctors. Hmm, interesting. Dr. Sawyer, in particular, is thought to have given Harding some stimulants that may have helped induce the president's fatal heart attack on August 2nd. Rather than drag Sawyer's name through the mud and perhaps bring her own judgment into question, Florence could have opted to simply close the book on the whole thing. So this kind of opens up a different avenue for this. Um, and th there's the possibility that we're just talking natural causes. Then we've got this story about the possibility that this is actually a poisoning. And that has a fork in it because there is an intentional poisoning, maybe done by someone, um, maybe his wife, or maybe someone that is acting on behalf of his wife. But then you've got another leg to that. It could have also been an unintentional poisoning, maybe by a doctor that was trying things that he shouldn't 
have been trying on someone of that age or using some type of drug or concoction that just wasn't the right choice. Um, Harding's body has never been exhumed and tested for poison. I'm kind of split on if I think there should be testing done on his body at this point, because especially talking about that fork uh, where we've got two possibilities, like if they do exhume him and they do find a poison, um, I think it's just going to shine the spotlight so hard on that book from 1930 and the theory about his wife. And I think there's another possibility in this that is just as likely or maybe even a little bit more likely. Uh, let's go ahead and continue with an article over at pbs.org. Mr. and Mrs. Harding's favorite doctor was an odd and charismatic homeopathic physician from Ohio named Charles Sawyer, who the president appointed as Brigadier General in the U.S. Army and the chairman of the Federal Hospitalization Board. Harding's other physician was the far better trained Joel T. Boone, a U.S. Naval officer and Medal of Honor winner. Dr. Sawyer was given to dosing the ailing president with, I think it's purgatives, uh, laxatives, and injections of heart stimulants, including the once commonly prescribed arsenic, which did not always sit well with Dr. Boone. Now, I don't know why, but as soon as I heard this was a poisoning story, the first thing I was thinking was arsenic. I got I to gotta look up arsenic. I got to see what the conditions or, or the side effects around arsenic poisoning are. Uh, back to Wikipedia, arsenic poisoning, long-term exposure can result in thickening of the skin, darker skin, abdominal pain. That's, he specifically spoke about that. Uh, diarrhea, heart disease, numbness. We've got numbness also described in his arm and cancer. But one of the side effects of long-term exposure is heart disease. The most common reason for long-term exposure is contaminated drinking water. Uh, yeah, and to prevent that, I, I'm glad that they wrote this out here on Wikipedia. Um, drink water without arsenic. But this all of a sudden just opens this whole thing up in my mind because I was we, we keep hearing this argument back and forth about, no, it wasn't poison because it was clearly heart disease. It was clearly heart disease. Well, now we've got a few pieces that are... Uh, wait, he's got this homeopathic doctor that's giving him all kinds of different injections and drugs. Oh, and by the way, um, one of those arsenic. And if you look at the side effects for long-term exposure to arsenic, heart disease is actually one of the side effects. So this is one of those things where I'm, for me, I'm leaning very strongly in a particular direction right now. Um, I'm leaning very strongly that this was accidental. I don't, I don't think this was planned. I don't think this was, I don't think it had anything to do with his wife at this point. That's just kind of where I'm at with it. Of course, it's up to you guys to make your own determination. Um, and there's a lot more information you could look into around this. We're, we're doing a very high level tap on this story, but um, arsenic poisoning, having that as a condition, I just, I, I can't shake that. That's, that seems very strong to me. Interestingly, in an article from only a few months ago, grandson of Harding and lover wants president's body exhumed. Now, when I first saw this headline, I was like, oh, wow, someone wants to drive at this. They want to do the drug testing and they want to see if this if this thing is real. No, nope, not quite. Uh, James Blasing told an Ohio court that he is seeking Harding's disinternment as a way to establish with scientific certainty that he is the 29th president's blood relation. What? What? It has been determined with scientific certainty. <laughs> A branch of the Harding family has pushed back against the suit filed in May, not because they dispute Blasing's ancestry, but because they don't. So Harding's family is saying, look, no one, no one is saying this isn't true. Like, you know, we, we get it. We're, we're related. Okay. This is all coming up because essentially uh, there are some upgrades that are happening. There's a new presidential center that's being opened in his hometown in Marion. Um, there's a, a, I think that on the website, they're doing some upgrades and stuff like that. And it seems like the Blasing family or 
I, I should say James in particular, is expecting some form of representation of their family's story in that. Uh, Blasing told the Associated Press, his mother's legacy as the daughter of a U.S. president is shaping up to be little more than a footnote in the new museum. He has not been approached to provide details of her life or even a photograph for the coming display. Ohio History Connection, which manages the Harding Home and Memorial, takes no position on the family dispute. Spokesperson Emmy Beach said the nonprofit accepts the 2015 DNA results as fact and plans a section of the new museum on Harding's relationship with Nan Britton and their daughter, Elizabeth Ann Blasing. So it's going to be in the museum. Uh, it just seems like her son's upset because no one's calling him. Like there's, there seems to be enough information out there that I don't think they necessarily need to talk to him to put together a display about that. It just, it's very strange to me. The openings of the uh, renovated historic sites in Marion and of the Warren G. Harding Presidential Center have been indefinitely delayed, of course, due to the coronavirus pandemic. So, uh, I guess that James has a lot of time to try to stage this fight and try to raise it even higher if he wants. I don't know. I, it's it, that one's a bit odd to me. Like, um, look, I pushing for the DNA completely made sense. Uh, and I do think it's a, it's a shame that that information came out so late because Elizabeth never, never came to know that, uh, certainly, her mother never came to know that, or or her mother knew, but never was validated or vindicated in how she put that information out. But getting back to the core of this story, do I think that that woman had something to do with poisoning that man? Uh, I, I don't think intentionally. I, I, I feel like there's a very good chance that we are talking about a long-term poisoning situation. And I think it just came from them putting their trust in a doctor uh, who was working with what he knew at the time to be his best practice. And they, we hear it from doctors all the time. It's called practice for a reason, but um, it seems to me like the uh, either natural cause, I, I can't rule out natural cause, there's uh, several of his visit, his physicians said that he had an enlarged heart. Um, but with some of the symptoms that I've been reading specifically around that trip and things that people were noticing, the side effects on the long-term arsenic exposure seem to be lining up with it. But even with that, I can't a hundred percent say that that, uh, rolls back to his, his doctor or Dr. Sawyer, uh, cause there are other ways that you could have. Uh, arsenic exposure as well. So I don't know. Are we ever going to get the answer to this mystery? I just don't see them. I don't see them going for that test. I just, I can't see what good it would do. Uh, it would open up a big question that they still wouldn't be able to answer, even if they do confirm that. Um, it's just, it's so we're a hundred years after the fact, trying to get information that could help us really come to a determination of what the source of the poisoning would have been practically impossible. Do I believe the story from the family that owns the uh, palace hotel? Mm, it really sounds like kind of family legends stuff to me. I, I sometimes feel like that stuff might have kernels of truth in it. Do I, do I believe the elements of that story as we reviewed it here today? No, no. And I'll tell you why this is the president. Uh, when there was a medical emergency, I'm, I believe there would have been people in that room within a matter of minutes. I believe that her having a confrontation with the first lady wouldn't have been allowed. I, I'm pretty sure someone would have intervened, intervened on that and, and separated them or tried to shut that down. I don't think she would have been fr free to roam around the room and grab a, a glass and then notice, oh, that smells kind of weird. As a matter of fact, I mean, we don't know that it's arsenic in particular, but I'm pretty sure arsenic has no smell. Um, there's... And then the, even the description of, oh yeah, and then Florence grabbed the glass and then poured it down a drain, like none of that seems realistic to me. It, it sounds like storytelling to me. There might be some points of it that are true. I, I think, would she have likely been called to the room at some point? Yes, but I think it would have been 
with a bunch of other people in there. And even at that point, are they going to let her into the room? Probably not. I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of elements of that story that just don't sit right with me. And the other thing is maybe there is a true story in that, but in the way that it's been retold throughout the years and with how the family is hearing it and recalling it, maybe some of those elements are being romanticized. Maybe it's shifting shape a little bit and now it's something else that it wasn't really at the time. That's kind of what I'm worried with about that story. So I don't know, brain scratchers. This is where I turn it over to you. And I know many of you out there are way bigger history nerds than I am, uh, and in particular, presidential history. So I'm really looking forward to checking out the comments and seeing what you guys have to say about all this. Is this really an unsolved murder? Are there other pieces of this puzzle that I haven't talked about here today? Please tell me about those in the comments down below. And if you can include links to sources, I'd really appreciate that as well. Before I end today's video, I want to thank a few new patrons. Thank you, Jacqueline Pugh. Thank you, Kaylee Morris. And thank you, Ursula Cotter. If you'd like to help support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, or buy merchandise. All of it helps keep me here doing it with limited commercials like we always do. And I really appreciate your support in helping me do that. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Take care. And I'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Arts channel.